It's our story. Stephen Brown, Louisville, Kentucky. In, I think, 1990, when I, as I said, when I was first thinking and talking and promoting disability culture myself, I was thinking about how to do it in a way that was effective. And what I learned really quickly was I could sit in front of an audience and I could intellectualize about all this stuff. And some people were passionate, as I said, in reacting to it, but it became clear to me, well, two things happened. One is I get bored by my own voice fairly quickly, believe it or not, and I didn't want to do the same thing for the next however many years. And the other thing was it really became clear to me quickly that people would be grabbed much more by actually seeing the culture than hearing anybody talk about it. So pretty quickly I started integrating what we today we call multimedia into um, my presentations. I started using music, um, I used videos or snippets of videos, um, I read poetry, and because I'm a person who writes poetry, I was thinking about what would I want to say um, about this. And so I wrote a poem called Tell Your, <coughs> excuse me, called Tell Your Story. I have to say that in some ways I'm a little sick of that poem. <laughs> uh, first of all, I don't write like that anymore. Um, and secondly, I've read that poem a lot of times now over the years. But um, those are the sort of down things that I've really had to get out. But on the other hand, I love that poem. And, um, and I very consciously tried to write a poem at that point that talked about disability culture. And I don't think I have it with me. I might have it on my computer if you want to try and get it later. But, but I can certainly send it to you. Um, but the whole point of that was, I, in the poem I talked about three different, um, three? Yeah, three different anecdotes. Um, one was about a person who was a wheelchair user and tried to go to a movie theater, who was a motorized wheelchair user, and tried to go to a movie theater and there wasn't a ramp. So he, unlike me, <laughs> he was gracious about it and he allowed them to lift him in there. But he came back about a week later with a bunch of other people in motorized chairs and said, you know, we want to go to the theater and we know it's not any problem, you can lift us in there. A ramp came to that theater really quickly after that. Then the second one is the experience of a person I worked with at the Independent Living Center in Norman. And we went to actually to Washington, D.C. And it was 1989, and the ADA of 1989, remember that? Most people don't, because <laughs> it didn't pass. The ADA of 1989 was being um, talked about in Congress, and George Bush had been elected, the first one, had been elected president not long before that, and one of his campaign promises was that he would support the ADA. And he was very silent about it at that point. So we did a protest, we did a march on the White House, called the Where is George March. And, um, and Candace, who was the person who I worked with, who happened to be deaf from a head injury, um, was with me at that march. And it empowered her so much. When she got back to Norman, one of the first things she did was get a group of deaf people together and tell the hospital that if they didn't get a TDD in the hospital, they were going to do some kind of protest which could have gone from a petition to um, a street protest. And there's no way she would have done that before she participated in that march. So that was incredibly empowering. And the third one is a story most of us who have anybody in our lives who is blind have experienced, which is you go to a restaurant and somebody comes up to you and says, what does he want? Or what does she want? <laughs> so I talked about those three um, experiences in this poem. And then um, as I said, it's called Tell Your Story. So the, um, the stanza that means the most to me actually is something like, um, if you don't tell your story, how will our children learn? And to me, that's what's really important about everything that we do, is that if we don't tell our stories, and fortunately many more of us are now, but if we don't tell our stories, how are our children going to know what we've gone through? And what 
how that has impacted them and what they might be able to do. I talked earlier in the day at a workshop about the League of the Physically Handicapped in the 1930s. And they were a group that did um, protests about New Deal programs and that didn't um, hire people with disabilities. And then nobody had ever heard of them for the next 50 or 60 years until they were accidentally uncovered in an archival search. Well, I don't want that to happen with the disability rights movement of today. I want people to, to know what we did and to have an impact forever. Um, I also had this wonderful experience um, um, in Chicago a month ago, the night before the parade, there was an open mic. And there were a lot of people there from Access Living, the Independent Living Center in Chicago, and some people from other places. And they were reading, <laughs> they read poetry, they um, um, synced, voice synced to a song, um, somebody there did a rap, um, all kinds of different different pieces were being read. And I had brought Tell Your Story with me. And, um, and I got up there, I was the last person to speak, and I said, well, I was, you know, I usually do this poem, Tell Your Story, but I don't need to do that tonight, because you've all told your stories. And so, and I didn't. And so that was wonderful. You know, people are telling their stories. And, um, and that's why, you know, on a roll, the Smith about the Smith, the film about Greg Smith, um, the kids are all right. The video that is being done about Mike Irvin. Um, still, the 60 Minutes interview with Ed Roberts that was done, I don't know how many years ago now, a lot of years ago. Um, Storm Reading, which is a play by Neil Marcus that was videotaped. Um, there's some, some other kinds of videos around, but <laughs> it doesn't matter how many of them are around. You know, there could be a hundred, a thousand around, there's still a need for um, these stories to be told to the American public so that not only our children learn, but everybody learns about what the disability rights movement, the disability culture movement um, has meant, first of all, to people with disabilities, but secondly, to our friends, our family, our allies, and third, to everybody else. Because until, one of my favorite sayings is, no one is free when others are oppressed. Until we're all an equal part of society, no one's an equal part. So for those and other reasons, it's really important to get work like this out there. The It's Our Story Project is a national effort to make disability history public and accessible. Visit us at www.itsourstory.org or on the It's Our Story Project YouTube channel.